Welcome to FRC Media News. For Thursday, May 21st, 2020, I'm Keith Tebow. This week, Governor Baker lays out details on how and when sectors of society will reopen in Massachusetts. What does this mean for local businesses and the city of Fall River? The region continues to deal with food insecurity, as well as a potential increase in domestic violence claims we'll explore. How has Diamond Regional taught their shop classes remotely? We'll tell you how. And we speak with Jorgen de Castro following his tough loss in his last UFC match. We'll have those stories all coming up. It was a big week in Massachusetts as Governor Baker on Monday provided details of how and when the Commonwealth will reopen towards some level of normalcy in the face of COVID-19. Now, a few weeks ago, the governor set out a four-phase plan of reopening with at least three weeks in between each phase. Monday gave a look into the basics of how phase one will work. These first steps, manufacturing and construction, provided these businesses follow the guidance we've developed, have limited face-to-face and customer interactions. And many similar operations open now under the essential order have been responsibly balancing operating and fighting the virus as well. Starting a week from now, we're permitting office space to reopen to 25% of its capacity, except in Boston. On May 25th, retail establishments may also offer curbside service and some personal services such as barbershops and hair salons may reopen, provided they follow the new rules in this report. Places of worship will also be permitted to open with guidelines in place starting today. A number of outdoor facilities and recreation activities may also resume starting a week from now, as well as in accordance with those new rules. And our health care facilities will be permitted to begin seeing more patients on an agreed-upon schedule over the next two weeks. This is not permanent. At some point, there will be treatments and ultimately a vaccine. But for the foreseeable future, everyone needs to continue to do the right things to bring the fight to the virus so that we can continue to move forward. Here are more specifics as to what elements will be allowed to open with restrictions during phase one. Opening this week, along with the essential services that have been open right along, is some manufacturing plants, construction, and places of worship. On that matter, the Diocese of Fall River has announced that Masses will begin next weekend, Saturday, May 30th. Also open in a limited capacity will be services at hospitals and community health centers. Opening Monday, May 25th, laboratories and life science facilities, offices at less than 25% capacity, hair salons, barbers, and pet grooming operations can open, but by appointment only. Car washes can open next week with exterior cleaning only. Recreational and other outdoor operations will be able to open with some guidelines. There'll also be another expansion for health care providers. And retail, not currently essential, can provide curbside pickup. During our weekly discussion with Fall River Mayor Paul Coogan, the mayor said he feels the governor's plans will be adhered to here in Fall River. He said concerns do arise, however as to some differences as to the scale of openings in both Massachusetts and nearby Rhode Island. One of the biggest businesses that's still closed, and it, it, and as you just said, people go back and forth to eat in Tiverton or Newport uh, are our restaurants. Um, I had a long conversation with Lieutenant Governor Polito about that. I know they were going to be opened in phase two, but again, I'm hoping that she took to heart what we in Fall River were telling her. I know a number of people talked to her and understood that, you know, if people can't go out to eat in Fall River or even go out to, to dine outside uh, with the restrictions, they're going to go over the border into uh, Rhode Island and hit those restaurants. So we brought that up to her. She said her working group was still aggressively studying the restaurant issue, and she hoped to have something done before phase two. So that would be one of the things I would like to see done uh, directly related to what you're speaking of, Keith, people going back and forth across the border and, um, and, and going out to eat. Um, 
we'd like to keep that um, that tax revenue in Fall River and get people from Rhode Island coming over here to eat. We need the money, so you know we have to we have to try to compete on some kind of a level field. So let's let's see how that goes. That's one of the biggest ones. Um, I know there's uh, talk about the casinos, um, the marijuana business. So people will be coming from Rhode Island. So there's going to be a back and forth across the border, and we just have to work together to make sure everybody's safe. Even though the governor has laid out his plans for businesses to resume operation, the mayor says he's taking a slow approach in reopening Government Center. I want to say I was looking at the end of next week, but I think that might be a little too aggressive. I think it might be the following week we'll start bringing people in on a limited basis for certain departments. Um, I think that that's how we can do it to make sure that, you know, we're doing all the things we can to keep all of our staff safe. I think we looked at something very similar to as you enter the building, your temperature's taken, you uh, wash your hands with sanitizer, you have a mask on, you go to your office. People will notice as they come into the building a lot more uh, plexiglass shields. Um, and again, that's both to keep um, the uh, public safe and the employees. Um, I, they'll see some changes. We're trying to minimize it so it doesn't look like... Um, Everything's in upheaval, but at the same time, we want people to be safe. We want people that work here to know that the residents that are coming in have, have uh, at least been checked out and they do have a mask on. So there's things we're doing to make sure we have a good, a good place for people to work and where we, uh, we can cater to the public. The mayor also said that libraries and senior centers will open in phase two or later as part of the governor's plans. Speaking of the governor's plans, leaders of the One South Coast Chamber agree that the measured approach to the openings by Governor Baker will be helpful to local businesses. He wants to do this safely. He's happy to be reopening, um, but he wants to do it very, very safely. I've sat on a couple calls with, uh, with Lieutenant Governor um, Polito and with Secretary Keneally, and the biggest concern is making sure that everybody does this safely. And it, and that's incredibly important because if we don't do it safely, we'll be shutting down again sometime in, you know, over the next few months. And we don't need that. We really the, so the emphasis is on safety and making sure that it's it works for customers, that it works for the businesses, which is why we're doing it in such a measured time in measured uh, way and with the different phases. And I think, you know, we do hear people say, well, why am I in phase two? Why am I in phase three? I'd rather be in phase one. You can always debate those types of things, but it's important that, they, that we do this slowly and do it the right way. Co-CEO Rick Kidder says even though not all businesses will be reopening at the same time, the chamber is looking to celebrate those that do with a promotion called Signs of Life. So we're going to be uh, soliciting and collecting pictures from a lot of our companies that are reopening uh, and start putting together a Facebook promotion at each phase of, of the economy. Uh, we believe we have a sponsor for this who may or may not be in the sign business. So Signs of Life may be a, uh, a program where we can start to do the things that we do best, which is celebrate the great stuff. And that great stuff is going to be reopening. So you'll see this in our social media outlets. You'll see it in our print production uh, and you'll see it in uh, uh, in uh, as many news outlets as we can possibly get it because we want to show the great signs of life of our economy coming back. Here are the latest local job opportunities from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Here are some health-related job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Substance Abuse Counselor. Acadia Healthcare Comprehensive Treatment Center, located at 22 Front Street, has an immediate need for a full-time substance abuse counselor to provide counseling and therapy to patients seeking recovery from opioid use disorder. Job number 1357418686. Housekeeper Child and Family Services, located at 66 Troy Street, has an immediate need for a full-time housekeeper to clean and sanitize kitchen, bathrooms, and public areas of the facility. Job number 1357326. Activities Assistant, 
Kimwell Healthcare, located at 495 New Boston Road, has an immediate need for a part-time activities assistant to implement activities that accommodate those with special needs. Job number 135-74082. Primacare, located at 277 Pleasant Street, has an immediate need for these full and part-time positions. Scheduling Specialist, job number 135-74930. Collection Specialist, job number 135-75089. The Sarah S. Brayton Nursing Center, located at 4901 North Main Street, also has an immediate need for the following full and part-time positions. Licensed Practical Nurse, job number 135-60644. Registered Nurse, job number 135-76042. For more information on these or other positions, visit Mass Hire Job Quest at jobquest.dcs.eol.mass.gov or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. Welcome back. Last week, Governor Baker announced the allocation of $56 million to combat the instances of food insecurity across the Commonwealth. We've spoken to local food pantries since the pandemic started to assess how they are serving those in need of food supplies. But there are some who are in need of food who cannot leave their homes. The United Way and United Neighbors of Fall River have developed a program where these people can get food delivered to their front door. Let's Talk on Tuesday brings together about 85 nonprofit partners, government officials, funders, providers in the area to collectively be a think tank and assess and sort of pivot if we have to with what's going on. There are also a few subcommittees that are specifically directed to the food distribution piece and to supporting our, the mental health and well-being, the educational supports, um, parent supports. We were most concerned with families that did not have the ability to get to one of the food pantries or one of the mobile marts that have been springing up or the grab-and-go lunch programs that the schools were providing. So we began to talk about how we can deliver about a week's worth of dinners to a family so that they would not have to come out of the house. This is not a free delivery service for every family. These are specific families that for whatever reason, maybe they're immune suppressed, maybe someone has been um, quarantined with COVID and they've been identified through our programs and through the school system. Many nonprofit partners like the, the Boys and Girls Club, the Family Resource Center, among others, and some of our businesses and local leaders like Baco Bank, Greater Fall River Partners for a Healthier Community, et cetera, all coming together. Some of our partners offering to uh, provide food for free through the Greater Fall River Food Pantry, for example. We meet and can be on a weekly basis every Thursday to pack bags and deliver the meals, and we have lots of volunteers. We started off with 101 families the first week, and then uh, Last week, we delivered 175. We are also providing uh, bagged lunches for homeless people that are on the streets. They're being delivered by Hearts of Hope. So we're utilizing six different local businesses. If we find additional money, we would certainly open it up to other restaurants. Our United We Help Feed Full River program, $60 supports a family for a week's worth of food. You can donate directly on the United Way page. Every penny they donate is going straight to our community. While many people have been spending more time at home during the pandemic, fears have arisen as to whether the tension of being homebound leads to an increase in domestic violence calls. Denise Pumaguaye spoke about this with the Women's Center and the Katie Brown Education Program. Domestic violence doesn't discriminate. Um, it doesn't discriminate on age. It doesn't discriminate on socioeconomic uh, background, it doesn't discriminate on race or ethnicity. So we work with individuals who are male, female, transgender. You know, there's a multiplicity of, of different genders in the way that people understand their gender. We did see an increase in uh, domestic violence outreach to our civilian police advocate at the beginning of the shelter in place. During those first two weeks of the shelter in place, we saw a almost a 55% increase 
We are providing a lot more remote services and we're trying to do a lot more through social media because so much of what we're doing is, is um, virtual. We also are providing um, telehealth services um, both for our advocacy, for our safety planning, and also for our counseling. They can call our helpline. It's a 24-hour helpline. That number is 508-675-0087. We have a number of uh, variety of languages that we can offer at that point. They will then be sent to the person who can help them most immediately. At the core of what we're doing, we are teaching students as young as eight so fourth grade through 12th grade, the skills they need to kind of to prevent themselves from being, you know, either victims or perpetrators of that type of violence. When they're really little, we're talking about boundaries and kind of emotional literacy and different things like that. As they get older, we're talking about stereotypes. And as they're like towards the end of middle school and in high school, we start delving into healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships. At kbep.org forward slash resources, there's a list of whether it's shelters or, you know, offices, just various resources and agencies that are open, that are taking um, care of folks who are unfortunately experiencing these types of violence during this time. Follow us on Facebook for that really great information. We've got stuff about confidence and power and control and you know, managing anger and just different things like that as well. We've created these themed wellness videos. And so they talk about these different aspects of relationships that can make a relationship either healthy or unhealthy, whether, you know, that quality is there or lacking. So be tuned to our social media for those types of tips and wellness tricks and just ways to take care of yourself. We have spent a considerable amount of time on this show asking how local students have dealt with remote learning since the pandemic closed local schools back in March. Overall, it looks like things have gone well. And that includes at Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School, where students have been learning remotely since March 17th. Assistant Superintendent and Principal Andrew Ribello tells us that the challenge at Diamond came in remotely teaching students their trades. You're never going to replicate hands-on, right? You're never going to be able to replicate that. However, our vocational teachers have done a tremendous job uh, with creativity and innovation on the fly, right? I, I tell our teachers all the time, we're flying the plane while building it. There's no manual that says, hey, this is how you teach vocational education online. Uh, but they are doing an incredible job. Manny Batello, our carpentry teacher, there's a house being built next to his, next to where he lives. He went to ask that contractor to see if he could partner with him so he could video himself doing some of the work. Kids are watching it. They're responding to it. They're critically thinking, answering questions and problem solving, culinary arts. They're asking to, uh, you know, make recipes and watch videos and then actually translate, you know, to their current reality of how they can implement some of that work that they're doing and learning uh, in their everyday lives. So it's actually benefited some students because of that vocational work, finding areas of their life where it's applicable. So um, the innovation and creativity of our teachers is unbelievable. Like other high schools across the country, Mr. Ribello tells us that the students in the class of 2020 at Diamond will not go unrecognized. They're a resilient group. Uh, they're gritty and they're going to come out on the other side of this wiser uh, and better because of it. Um, but, you know, I promised every single senior, you know, we, they will not go unrecognized. Their accomplishments will not go unrecognized. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we purchased senior lawn signs and uh, we had over 50 teachers make home deliveries to, you know, give those seniors their lawn signs. We have another special, uh, we have special surprise for them during uh, senior textbook drop off and locker return. We have a drop, uh, drop, uh, drive by drop off coming up soon um, for seniors. We have a surprise for them then. Um, and then we also push back prom and graduation and our awards night and outstanding vocational student night uh, to August. So we are hopeful that we'll be able to gather as a group and have an in-person event for all four of these uh, cer uh, ceremonies and celebrations, um, even if it's modified. Diamond's last day of school for this academic year is slated for June 19th. We'll have more right after this.
thank you for considering a homeless pet today. I hope you enjoy what you're about to see, and as always, please feel free to contact the shelter before coming down to make sure that the pets you're viewing are still available for adoption. We can be reached at 508-677-9154. Welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. Today we have Pinto. Pinto is a English Bulldog mix. He is a little over one years old, but still very much a puppy. He might not be showing it right now, but Pinto is very high energy, and he really needs an experienced owner who can handle a dog with a lot of energy that needs to get out and run and play. Due to his high energy level, it would be best if he were not in a home with children or cats. So if you have the experience to deal with a high energy puppy brain and you're willing to put in the time required, Pinto has the potential to make a great addition to the family. So if you want to see him, come on down to Forever Paws Animal Shelter at 300 Linwood Street and check him out. Today we have Fiona. Fiona here is an older, in fact by older I mean 12 year old, uh, 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 seal point. Uh, she is a shy older lady, but oh, she's, she's coming out of her shell now. She's going to go and say hi to Bear. But she herself is very sweet. As you can see right now, we're kind of letting her do what she, what she feels she's comfortable with. A calmer home would be best. She would be great uh, for, an, for an older couple or older individuals uh, who, or who are looking for you know, somebody, to, uh, somebody nice and calm to, uh, to hang out with, have a little, share a little companionship, so to speak. So if you'd like to meet Fiona, you can come down to 300 Linwood Street in Fall River, Massachusetts at Forever Paws Animal Shelter. Finally, with most professional sports on the shelf, UFC bouts continue. That includes fights featuring Fall River's own Jorgen DeCastro. The heavyweight lost his last bout in a unanimous decision two weeks ago. He sat down with Megan Holden and Sam Rodriguez recently on their Locked In podcast. Today we have a special guest, UFC fighter, Fall River's own Jorgen DeCastro. Jorgen, how are you doing today? Doing good. Good? good? Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, talking about the fight, I was, I was, I've seen it. You, found it. you were aggressive in the first round, in the second round of the injury. You kind of more reserved and protective. Can you tell me how the injury, you feel like, impacted the fight? I had him in the first round. The kicks was good. I should come up second round, like, try to maybe rush in, take downs, and then make him forget about the kick and then finish him with a kick. So, but I was so focused and my killing steam was so in my eyes. I say, I just have to kick him two or more two, three times, and I'm going to finish him. So mm -hmm. one of the kicks, I, I caught him right, my top of the foot caught him right in the knee, in his kneecap, that I felt the instant. And I say, oh, uh, either I'm going to stay here and because I have power, I say, I'm going to, if he come in, I'm going to throw points and maybe call him or, or I mean, let's, or I'm going to get finished. him if he come forward and I can move it. It is what it is. He probably did more than me, so he, he, he got the fight. But it, I'm, I'm going to learn him. The next time I'm going to set up my kicks better, I'm going to mix it up better. Anything that you can take away from this fight that you're going to use for the next fight? Anything specifically? This is a high-level sport with a high-level athlete. So I'm going to step up my game. I'm going to take my nutrition to an all-new level. I'm going to take my, 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 my strength and condition to an all-new level. I'm going to focus. I'm going to, I'm going to drop somebody fat, maybe come a little leaner next time, 245, 250. Better cardio, push forward. And I mean, we got a lot. Of, I think I, have, I still have room to grow and, and improve. And... Uh, I mean, I'm going to step up my game. I mean, this is one it's in a lifetime chance, and I'm going to take all over. Do you have a timetable as to when to your foot will be fully healed? Full healed, I don't know, but they say I'm going to be able to, to train in one or two weeks. I'm going to be able to lift and do something. I'm not going to be able to sparring, but I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to lift and do so take care of my body. I can't wait to get back. Hey, man, looking we forward can't wait to, to see it. you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Just a reminder, our Dinner Time With series continues tomorrow night at 6 p.m. with a performance by the local duo Two Across. Check them out on Channel 95 as well as on our FRC Media Facebook page. That'll do it for this edition of FRC Media News. We invite you to continue to log on to our website, frmedia.org, for the latest information on COVID-19 in Fall River as well as our programs on FRC Media channel 95. This program airs Thursdays at 6 p.m. and Fridays at 5.30 p.m. 
for all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Please have a great Memorial Day weekend and enjoy the rolling parade on Monday. We'll see you next Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.